I'm curious to know what the impact of coronavirus is having in Malaysian ophthalmology clinics. It looks like you're in clinic right now. Uh, yeah. So you're still working? Yeah, so basically, um, in general, we have stopped all non-urgent cases. So all the clinics and operating cases have been reduced drastically. We're only seeing emergencies. So I'm only working on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The reason being is that um, we've split our doctors and nurses and staff into two teams that come on alternate days because there's a high risk of one of us getting infected and we don't want all the whole center to be shut down because all of us need to be quarantined. And also the volume of patients has dropped so much, so there's very little work to do now. What kind of procedures would still be required to do at this point? We are seeing all the usual red eyes, infections, patients who have lost vision. I did an operation on Wednesday, which is a retinal detachment. And that's quite urgent. I've been still continuing with my intravitreal injections for AMD because these patients will go blind if they miss their injection appointment. And I'm also seeing all my post-op follow-up patients. I noticed that certain companies now, Zeiss, Topcon, are creating sort of these plastic screens that can be used when you're doing slit lamp examinations. If we put them on all our machines, I can show you my slit lamp here. Can you see? And what device is that? It's a Topcon uh, slit lamp, but basically I just stuck a, we just stuck a piece of acetate. Uh, we just cut a hole in it and just, and just hung it onto the, onto the slit lamp. It, it's, 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 it can be done in two minutes, do it yourself. And in fact, if you use in hospitals with uh, the old x-ray films, they are the perfect material to cut and, and fit onto your slit lamp. So you don't really need to purchase or, or get these pre-made ones. So you've made this yourself, your clinic has, it's easy enough to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's no problem. But it, I mean, we never did it before, but only because of this coronavirus that we decided that we had to protect ourselves. So we put it up. Now, Ken, you've been in a leadership role in Malaysia for a long time, president of the Malaysian Society of Ophthalmology. Where do you see Malaysia in this outbreak? Is Malaysia performing well in terms of the quarantining and that sort of thing? Yeah, Matt, I think it's a great question. Okay, I'll give you in context. We've been in quarantine for two and a half weeks now. And actually, the numbers of new cases has, has actually plateaued to about 150 cases a day. If you look at US and Europe, this would have gone exponentially up to thousands of cases a day. I think it's worked very well in Malaysia. Everyone is taking it very seriously. And I think we are, we are seeing the flattening of the curve very clearly in Malaysia. Do you know of anyone in our industry, any patients that have gotten coronavirus yet? You are the first, actually. No, I don't know direct contacts. I know friends of friends or close calls. I, I know ophthalmologists who had to be quarantined because they were in contact with suspected cases, but they were tested negative. And you know, today I want to pull up a report that I saw today by Dr. Bill Trattler. He says, hi everyone, I wanted to share an article I wrote with Gary Wartz and others that puts together some of the basic science and clinical studies around hydroxychloroquine for both prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19. Multiple studies suggest that this medication can speed recovery and help eliminate the virus in hospitalized patients. Uh, do you know anything about this medication and whether it certainly could be used for uh, prophylaxis? Hydroxychloroquine is actually a treatment for rheumatological conditions, SLE. So it's for um, the rheumatologists, the ones that use it most. Ophthalmologists only see these patients because hydroxychloroquine can cause blindness. So this drug can actually deposit in your retina and cause permanent loss of vision. So we need to monitor the dose very carefully. The dose that is recommended by these doctors for COVID-19 is quite high doses and it may cause problems with your vision. So we don't have any specific, I don't have any specific recommendation for it. I think in Malaysia, it's being reserved for the seriously sick patients because there is a shortage of it. And also, we are not sure of the side effects of it. So if you're a well, a healthy person, please don't take hydroxychloroquine because there was also a report in the US of a patient who actually died from chloroquine poisoning.
because they were so scared and they went outside and just bought something had a bad word chloroquine and then and they died from being Is that medication chloroquine as opposed to hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, exactly. Hydroxychloroquine has a much lower dose than chloroquine itself. Both drugs are used in the treatment of malaria. So this was ori originally a malaria drug. So the safest to use is hydroxychloroquine. And the recommended dosage is not more than 400 milligrams a day or something like that. So I think, I think we have to be very careful about the dosage and how long you have to take it for. So a patient like myself, you know, I, I had very mild symptoms. I had no fever. You would say for someone like me, definitely don't take that. No, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't take that. And certainly my infectious disease colleagues who are treating COVID-19 patients say that this is considered still an experimental treatment. It's only reserved for the severely ill patients. Most patients like yourself recover on their own with, with, with supportive treatment and observation. The really bad patients, those that need to go to ICU, are really the ones that are having a severe immune reaction to the virus itself. So they have kidney failure, they have cardiac failure, and their lungs are, are failing. These patients are going to do badly no matter what you give them, I think. You know, I'm sure that there are a lot of patients out there that are scared, that are looking for a treatment. You know, I myself here in local hospital, hospital quarantine in Vietnam, after I came down with coronavirus, I've received no medication at all. I was okay. You know, I got through it without too much trouble. But I wonder for those patients who are starting to get severe, in those cases, you know, as a last resort, hydroxychloroquine, you know, would you recommend it? Yeah, I think I think if I was I was really ill, I mean I'll definitely try anything. But you have to understand that on top of hydroxychloroquine, the doctors are going to be giving them antivirals as well. So we don't okay. know the interaction between hydroxychloroquine and antivirals. And Malaysia has been chosen by the WHO to trial a new antiviral called Rans Resmavir. So I think they're going to start trials on that as well uh, this week. I think these antivirals will probably be more useful than hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Ken, when do you think Malaysia is going to return to normal such that clinic can operate normally again? I think it'll be another three months at least. I think we're looking by June, July, things should stabilize. We're very strict social distancing rules and then um, active surveillance. We're going to be testing everybody. What I was talking about today, I just had a webinar with about 200 ophthalmologists in Malaysia about this issue and then what I think will happen is that all healthcare workers around the world will need to go for COVID-19 tests. That will be the rapid antigen test. And if you have antibodies to COVID-19, that's good news. So you can be issued a certificate like what they're proposing in Germany that you've been exposed to the virus and you can continue work as normal. But if you don't have the antibodies, then you, can, you remain at risk of contracting the infection and you should take even more st stricter precautions. And this will be the way for the next year or so worldwide until we have a vaccine or more than 60% of the world population has been affected by the virus. So someone like me in the future could get a certificate to say, yes, you know, I've had this. I therefore have antibodies. I could work in a healthcare environment. Yeah. And actually your plasma is very valuable. So, you know, you might want to consider donating your plasma for research purposes to see whether they can use those antibodies to treat the very sick COVID patients. That's interesting. You know, one other thing that I noticed, Ken, uh, I, I experienced a bit of a rash in hospital here uh, on my back and on my head. I didn't see any reports about that at all in the news related to COVID. I switched shampoos. I still had the same sort of thing. So I wonder if, if there are certain things about this disease that we still don't know in terms of the signs and symptoms. Yeah, I think that sounds like more like an immune reaction. Your body is trying to fight the virus and it manifested in a mild rash. Whereas uh, some other people might manifest with cardiac failure or kidney failure and things like that. Well, so I guess, uh, you know, it's better to have a rash over, over something else in that case. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But you know what's worrying, Matt? is the latest report is more than 50% of patients with COVID are asymptomatic. So we have many, many people out there who are not aware that they're infected and they're just spreading it everywhere. Which is why I think the West has to change their views about mask wearing. You know, and what's you notice that in, in, in Asia, mask wearing is almost mandatory everywhere we go. And I, I don't walk around 
anywhere now without a mask because number one, I may be, I don't want to spread it to others. And number two, I don't want others to spread it to me. Well, Ken, I just, somebody just walked in here. I just want to show you, you know, they, they've got the full hazmat suit on and uh, they're very, they're being very cautious here in Vietnam. I'm definitely in isolation here. Although yeah. there are patients in other units that are being uh, put together with, with coronavirus. It seems Vietnam and Asia as a whole is doing a fairly good job with containing this, with you know, doing the best it can in terms of treatment versus the West. Is it, is it our time to lead in, in this moment? Definitely. I think you know, there's two big things that are going to come out of COVID-19. Number one is the way we live our life. We basically met you and I. We're not going to see each other so frequently at conferences anymore because there's going to be less and less of all these big eye conferences that we go to every month. Uh, we've okay. got to stop all these long haul travel. The second thing, I think China is going to rise in the world as a, as a global superpower, which will overtake the US and the rest of the world because China has been a great example of how to contain this virus outbreak and also have been very, very generous with their knowledge and also they've been donating PPE, personal protective equipment, to countries around the world. And Malaysia just received a few hundred thousand N95 masks from China in the last week alone. I think it's going to really change the, the, the worldview and, and then we're going to pivot more towards the East, which I think is, is long overdue anyway. What, what do you see the tie-ins between ophthalmology and this issue that we're facing? I've seen you know, there's some differential diagnosis going on between COVID and even conjunctivitis. Uh, what are you seeing out there? Basically, in Malaysia, we are assuming that any patient that presents with conjunctivitis is COVID-19. Because you don't know. When a patient comes with viral conjunctivitis, it looks exactly the same, regardless of what virus is causing it. And the reports have shown that up to 5% of patients with COVID-19 get a red eye conjunctivitis. So sometimes that could be a presenting symptom. And in, in any ophthalmologist around the world, you will get a conjunctivitis patient coming at least once or twice a week seeing you. So in, in a year, average ophthalmologist will see up to 50 to 100 conjunctivitis patients a year. Ken, the Malaysian Society of Ophthalmology, uh, are you guys doing anything in this time in terms of education, in terms of putting your best foot forward, and in terms of getting ophthalmologists, even themselves financially, insulated from this time that we're in? Okay. I mean, in terms of private practice, definitely everyone's affected. I mean, all industry, businesses, private ophthalmology, Everybody is down. I think we have to accept there will be financial losses, but I think most people are resilient. We should be able to write through this. In terms of the society, we have issued guidelines to our members to stop the uh, non-urgent clinic and operation theatre cases. We have given them advice about personal protective equipment, about how to run a screening service at your clinic. We screen all our patients. From a financial level, the society has also donated quite a lot of money to our COVID-19 hospitals to purchase PPE for their staff there. So financially, we're supporting them and, and we are also supporting our members now. We are, we've just hosted our first webinar on COVID-19 today. So next week, we'll have a few more seminars for, for members of uh, optometry, opticians, and also further learning programs. But I think the way the MSO is going to approach meetings in the future will be more virtual meetings rather than face-to-face -face meetings. Interestingly, we were supposed to have a pediatric ophthalmology meeting this weekend in KL itself, but we had to postpone it to September. That's interesting. And, and do you think that these meetings in the future will be more virtual and not so physical because the world has now changed? People are more fearful of meeting in large public places? Definitely. Definitely. At a personal level, I've I was supposed to go for, you know, you see me almost every month at, around the world. And sure. I was supposed to be in a meeting. I've, I've cancelled at least four meetings since the outbreak in January. And, and for, for the next six months, I think almost all my foreign meetings have been cancelled. So I think this is going to have a huge impact on the industry as a whole. I suppose the, the APAO will move forward in Xiamen. China seems to have a better hold on things at the moment. But we, we still don't know for sure just because the situation in the world still changes so rapidly day to day. Well, interestingly, I think things have changed because China is the safest place to be in the world now. And they have, yeah. they have stopped foreigners entering the country. So I'm not sure if APO Xiamen will happen because China does not want 
all these infect, potentially infected foreign delegates coming into their country. I see. And the time frame between now and then is still probably too short in terms of America, Europe resolving their cases and not bringing that to China, right? We have not seen the worst yet in Europe and America, I'm afraid to say. I mean, the projections are frightening. If you heard Dr. Fauci speak, they're expecting 200,000 deaths in the U.S. alone, which is credibly huge number of patients. For example, I was just hearing the message from David Park, CEO of the AAO, and he was expressing optimism that the American Academy meeting in Las Vegas in November will still go ahead as normal. And I think he's very optimistic. The APAO in Malaysia next year, do you think that that's a long enough timetable to be able to hold that, or we still don't know? I'm optimistic we can, because it's about a year away. I think it's still possible. We will see reduced numbers of delegates for sure. The moment is all systems go for that, because by that time, we'll have a lot more secure measures in place. The, I think the planes will be flying again, the airports will be open, and, and we'll just have to handle it like we do any viral outbreak the usual precautions, you know, and, and I suspect we'll be seeing all the delegates walking around with masks. Yes. Well, you know, it reminds me a little bit of 9-11 in terms of when that terrorist attack happened in New York. At some point, people felt like they had to go on living their lives and accept a different amount of risk. So Correct. I wonder if that will be eventually the mentality. Yeah, I think so. I think a few major international meetings will have to continue, APO being one of them, AAO, the main European meetings, and so on and so forth. But well, a lot of the smaller satellite meetings or single specialty meetings will probably be scaled down. I'm sure you realize the APA CRS in Singapore this July has been postponed to a year's time next year. So I think the reality is that, you know, we'll have to face the facts that we'll have reduced our expectations of how many delegates attending these meetings. Well, fascinatingly, I just woke up last night after feeling my phone vibrate. I got a message from a friend that the WOC has gone virtual. And yet I thought that was positive because instead of canceling or postponing, they're going virtual. That means that education will continue and people will still connect. Matt, there's nothing like a face-to-face -face meeting. I think I think virtual meetings are good. I don't think it'll be the same experience as a, as a good meeting because I think part of it was a lot of us were looking forward to visit South Africa for the first time. So the, the destination right. is always part of the attraction of the meeting. So it's good that they're planning an alternative virtual meeting, but there's a lot of other things we have not considered as in the loss of income to the delegates, how to claim back their flight tickets and so on and so forth, and also for the industry as well. Well, Ken, I think I'm being uh, summoned here by the medical staff, so thank you very much for uh, for joining me today here at, at Pie and Cake Magazines, and keep on the good fight, and we'll see each other somewhere or virtually again somewhere. Okay, bye, Matt. Thanks, Ken. Bye-bye.